Well, good evening or good morning to you uh, in the Antipodes, uh, and uh, welcome to another live broadcast from the Bible Believers podcast. Um, Ian, thank you for your comment. Uh, I just want to say, Ian, thank you. I'm very encouraged by your input on this channel, and thank you for being here and uh, uh, helping out the work that's going on. That's a great blessing, and thank you so much for that, and others as well who are doing the same. Uh, but thank you, Ian. So uh, today I've probably bitten off a large topic and I'm thinking, well, maybe this should have been extended to a much longer series, but uh, uh, that's, that, alas, is not going to be the case. But uh, this subject of uh, marriage and divorce and remarriage is burgeoning out and becoming bigger. And it's something that affects so many people, even in the churches in these days, that I think it's really important. And as you know, it's affected me as well. I'm fine now, but uh, I went through a very difficult patch because of what happened to me and others of us have been through something similar. And even if we haven't, my hope is that what I'm saying this evening will, just adjusting the camera there, sorry, um, will help any of us who listen, not just those who have experienced marriage or marriage and divorce or marriage and divorce and remarriage, but Christians from every background. And um, Kim, welcome, uh, and the Lord be with you and bless you. Micaiah, thank you for your encouragement, and the Lord bless you. Uh, and so we're con considering this topic this evening, and I've get titled it uh, Fear, um, fear, um, Anger, Bitterness, and Forgiveness uh, in Divorce. And these are things that were very important to me as well in my own experience, as well as they are to everybody else. We're all human. We have a fallen human nature, and we have to wrestle and struggle sometimes with great difficulties, great challenges, uh, and great distresses as well as we um, as we go through life's experiences. Proverbs twenty nine two. Hello, welcome, and uh, uh, welcome to you. And the Lord bless you and others who've, who've joined us now. So, for our reading, let's read Psalm. Well, before I come to the reading, just mention one thing: that UK, UK is in turmoil. The prospect is now of a large um, Islamic vote in the houses of uh, Parliament in future generations, in future, after the next general election, uh, and things that some people have been warning about for a long, long time seem to be starting to happen, so that the Prime Minister is even issuing an urgent uh, response to the situation uh, as um, seemingly religious parties become uh, present in the Houses of Parliament through the so-called democratic pro process. Um, these are very difficult days for us as a nation. This isn't what I'm talking on tonight, but these are very difficult days for us as a nation. Bernadette, a very warm welcome to you, and Miriam, a warm welcome to you as well, and thank you for joining us. So, but let's turn tonight, let's go back to our subject, which is some of the challenges that we can face as Christians if, we have, if we're unhappy enough and if we are uh, called to go through that unpleasant and, uh, and very difficult experience of divorce something which as i say i've been through myself and uh which is uh which is what can be it's always bad it's always distressing it's always it's always um damaging to somebody or everybody involved uh, and as such we we do need encouragement to understand it to, to manage it to to um handle it in a manner which is honoring and glorifying to god uh, many of us have no choice many of us have no um uh alternative in the things that happen to us and uh i think as i said i've said before there are those who are innocent parties in in divorce not all of us are necessarily innocent parties but the lord knows that too and we must bring everything under the blood of jesus christ where there is forgiveness and mercy and restoration and reconciliation as as we're considering this topic, uh, one of the things again I thought I should do is go through and list everything in every topic, and I realised I've got a bad habit of doing that. That uh, if I choose to, to speak on a topic, I try and say everything there is to say on it, and you can't possibly say everything you can say about these topics, fear, bitterness, and so on, or forgiveness in in, in uh, a single thing, let alone all of them in a single thing. So I'll try and say by God's grace, and this has been my prayer, something helpful on each topic to everybody, but by no means exhaustive. But as we consider these topics, I want to turn particularly to Psalm 23, because I think Psalm 23 will tell us an awful lot about these things and give us an awful lot of God's solutions to these difficulties that we may face. So Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside 
the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I find this great comfort in Psalm 23 for all of us, um, not just those who have experienced or are experiencing the things we've spoken of. Gavin, good evening. I just want to read one more verse before we um, dive in, uh, and that is in Romans chapter 14 and verse 8. Romans 14, verse 8. Just to remind us of our standing in the Lord Jesus Christ and to, to, to say that whatever's going on in our lives, whatever challenges, difficulties, disasters, um, tribulations and trials, uh, if we're Christians, if we know Jesus Christ and we're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ alone for our forgiveness, then we belong to the Lord and he cares for us and he is uh, totally interested in us and in our situation and invested in us. Romans 14 verse 8 reads, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. Our lives are in God's hands. Let's live our lives for God's glory. And if we come into these difficult circumstances where we can find ourselves extraordinarily challenged with difficulties, let us walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we ask and pray that you would help us this evening. The prayer of the speaker is that everyone would receive something which is of strong encouragement to them, Lord, that there would be blessing and encouragement and there would be confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, confidence in your un unwavering and your unfaltering love towards us, even when we are in life's most difficult places. And so, Father, I ask and pray that you speak to each heart. Thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world and purchased us with his blood so that if we have faith in him, if we are trusting him and alone and we are true Christians, then we are saved forever by your grace and the sufferings of this present time and nothing compared to the glory that shall be revealed. So we ask for help and we ask for strength and I ask, Lord, that you'd help those who are struggling and those who are finding it hard and those who are not um, necessarily here for the live broadcast, but we'll lift this in afterwards. I just pray, Father, that you'd speak to us and help us and bless each one of us and pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. And these things we ask and pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, as I say, I think I'm going to have to try and say one useful thing on each of the topics rather than do an exhaustive treatment of all of them. That would be foolish on my part. So again, a very warm welcome to those of you who've just joined us. We're considering fear, um, anger, bitterness, and forgiveness in divorce. And I, I start by saying this again, that these are all things that which have challenged me because I am a divorced man, because my marriage fell to pieces, because uh, four years ago my marriage came to an end. And uh, that was probably one of the most, if not the most distressing thing that ever happened to me in my life. And there have been many trials and tribulations, but the Lord Jesus has proved himself to me to be a faithful saviour and has brought me through. And I want, therefore, to encourage and help other people. I'll draw on my own experiences. I realise that uh, whatever my experiences, some people's experiences have been much worse than mine. Some people have faced much greater challenges and difficulties. I wasn't left with a group of young children, for example. I wasn't left unable to work, for example. Uh, I wasn't left with uh, in a situation where my ex-wife and I were still going at each other, hammer and tongs, trying to destroy each, trying to destroy the other. Not that I would do that. That wouldn't be Christian anyway. But uh, I'm very thankful that there is um, now uh, what I would call a good friendship between the two of us. And that's that's um, that's a very um, that's the best outcome, I think. And uh, I thank God for that. But not all of us are in that situation. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not saying that. Uh, that I've done well and others are doing badly. Um, for the most part, I had no control over the situation and neither do many of us. But uh, but the Lord has allowed me not to go into the worst possible situation. Some people are in much worse situations. So I'm not trying to either condemn anybody else or try and say uh, that uh, others haven't experienced 
even greater distress than I did when these things were going on in my life. Fear. Okay, let, let me just start with an example and explain why I'm using this example. 24 years ago, I was alone in my house in Aberdeen in the north of Scotland, and it was a snowy day um, 24 years ago, and a pipe burst in the, in the um, loft, and that was damaging the ceilings and stuff. So I had to go up into the loft on my own and, and try and sort it out. Now, I cannot figure out why I did this, but for some strange reason, I found myself falling through the open loft hatch um, onto the landing below. And uh, this was uh, this was not a good thing to do. Um, I, I'm tempted to say we've all done it, but I hope we haven't all done it because it certainly isn't recommended falling out of the loft onto the landing. Now, on the way down, quickly, two thoughts flashed through my mind. I remember this very clearly. The first was, what did I do that for? Um, which seems like a very rational thought under the circumstances. And the second thought that flashed through my mind was, there's no way I can stop what happens next. And with that, of course, I hit the floor. So not recommended. Um, that's a long time ago. Um, you'll be pleased to know that I made a full recovery not too long after that. But what happened was I, 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 I very badly, very badly sprained my ankle. I know it was bad because uh, my... Uh, ankles swelled up to an enormous size and I'd spent my career looking at people's swollen ankles and mine seemed to be bigger than any other ankle that I could remember. I also broke my foot. Now here's the problem. This had me bed bound for some time, uh, I say for three weeks. Uh, and it was at a time when I, I desperately needed work uh, and when uh, finances were very tight and when there were six mouths to feed and a dog and some guinea pigs. And um, this was one of those situations where uh, I found myself desperate because I needed to work. And I thought, will I ever work again? Will this ankle ever get better? What's happened? Is this ruining things? Now, some of us will have experienced this, not just in divorce, but in other things. But th you can go through a situation where you become almost overwhelmed by, uh, a, 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 not an irrational, because it's quite rational in this situation, but fear. Fear takes over. It gets a grip of you. What if I never work again? What if my ankle never heals? What if I never get work? What if I can't pay the bills? Now, some of us have been through that. Some of us have been through it more than once. And so that kind of fear, that kind of fear, which is, I think, common to human beings, common to us when we're in these kinds of situations, occurred. And it's the same kind of fear. I found myself during the separation with my now ex-wife i find myself from time to time getting these overwhelming waves of fear that came over me um what if i'm left with nothing what if i can't find a place to live uh, what if uh, what if i don't get work again similar things now the answer to this fear but i'm saying this because because although as christians we're not supposed to be afraid we can't put a brave face on this we have to face up to it as sinners we still suffer with fear in this world. As those who are of little faith, uh, like the disciples in the boat when the storm was raging, or Peter when he was trying to walk on the water, we tend to sink. Or we tend to think that we're about to sink and the Lord will let go of us. The thing to do with fear is this, um, is to bring it to the Lord, isn't it? So in divorce, we have a fear of being abandoned. We fear that we'll grow old on our own or fear that uh, nobody will love us anymore, that we'll be hated, that we'll be rejected by friends and, and family. And that can happen. Uh, and um, we have all these fears about everything that's going on. We can be absolutely overwhelmed by what's going on and we can, uh, we can feel paralyzed by the situation. That's our human response. And we need to take our, our fear to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that I don't feel afraid. I do feel afraid, but it's something very, very important that I can do. If fear washes over me, if I find myself paralyzed with fear, if I find myself finding it really difficult to grasp that somebody who I once loved is, is now um, attacking me in this way and uh, going for me, and I don't know what to do, and I'm worried about the outcome, and I, I can't face uh, going out into the world, then take it to the Lord Jesus Christ because he'll never abandon you. The Lord Jesus is with you there. The Lord Jesus will have mercy on you. And the thing to do with this fear is to go to God and say, Lord, I'm afraid. Lord, I'm, I'm feeling overwhelmed with fear. I'm feeling absolutely, so I can't 
go forward. I can't go on. I don't know what to do. I, I've been there. I've experienced that in a, in a small way when I fell out of the loft and in a much bigger way when I was facing being divorced and losing my home. The Lord Jesus is so much greater than all of these things. So the thing we should do is we should go to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer and, and tell him that we're afraid and tell him that we don't know how we're going to go on and tell him that although we know that we shouldn't be afraid, we are. I'm just going to quickly look at the four verses. 2 Corinthians 7, 5. 2 Corinthians 7, 5. Now, it's one thing to know the scriptures and to know what 2 Corinthians 7, 5 says, but it's another thing to have these in our hearts. And it's praying through these things, bringing them to the Lord, presenting them to him and asking that they would be a reality in our lives that, that helps us. For me in my situation, both in the loft and also 24 years ago, and also in my divorce, I am living proof that God has brought me through all of these trials and many others besides. So 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5 reads, For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. The Apostle Paul experienced this as well. We read about this last time. The question is what we do with our fears when we don't think we can go on, when we are afraid of being attacked, when our friends reject us, when we're not sure if we'll see the children again. We take our fears to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's big enough to shoulder them. He's big enough to help us. And he's helped me and he's helped many, many others. And he will help us always. I'm quite sure there are many trials to come in my life yet if I live um, and uh, serve the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1, 7. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. In the word of God, we read, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So that fear doesn't come from the Lord. It comes from the flesh. Now it's very real. And again, there's no great shame in saying I'm afraid. But we can bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, take away my spirit of fear. I'm afraid. I'm terrified, in fact. I'm paralyzed with fear. But Lord, have mercy on me and give me that spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind in that situation. Hebrews 13, verse 6. Hebrews 13, verse 6. And I, I am aware of the time, and there's a lot to get through, so I shall pace myself so that we don't uh, end up going on for far longer than I ought to. Um, but Hebrews 13, verse 6. Let's see if I can turn the scriptures. So that we may, so Hebrews 13, verse 6. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Some of us are afraid of what our former spouses or our spouses who are divorcing us. We're afraid of what will happen to us. We're afraid of what others will do to us. We can be afraid of the divorce lawyers who seem to have very big teeth and uh, a very um, strong bite. Um, and here in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6, the Lord is my helper. The Lord will be with us in all of these situations. The Lord can help us. The Lord can enable us to face our foes without fear. So we bring ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Psalm 23, verse 4, because we read Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me through the valley of the shadow of death. When when divorce papers were filed against me I thought that was the end of my life it's not that I was suicidal because I, I wasn't but I thought what's the point in living I thought what's the point in going on I thought I can never be useful in the Lord's service again I thought I am so affected by this that the Lord Jesus will never use me for his glory again why would he want to use somebody like me a divorced person like me well, the answer is I've been freed up to do more Christian work than I was before. And that's one real blessing that has come out of a very negative and very difficult situation. But the Lord Jesus hasn't cast me off. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, how can I live through this? How can I get through this? Thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I will fear no evil. For some of us, going through a divorce is like going through the valley of the shadow of death. It feels like that. It seems like that. But the Lord Jesus is with us. Thou art with me. 
Jesus will be with you there. He won't forsake you. He won't cast you off. Uh, we said last time a bruised reed, he won't break. He won't crush you. He won't discard you. He will walk with you in the valley of the shadow of death, and he will comfort you with his rod and with his staff. The Lord Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So in our fear, we should take our fear to God. We should tell him when we're afraid. We should ask for that sound mind and that, that spirit of a sound mind, and we should keep praying. But the thing is this, we should cast ourselves with confidence on the Lord. The Lord won't cast us off. He won't, he won't get rid of us. He won't put us away because we are going through a process of divorce. The Lord still loves us. He still has mercy on us. And as I can say in my case, look at me. Here I am seeking to serve God. This is thrilling to me to be able to try and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you saw me four years ago, I'd be saying, it's all over. There's nothing I can do now. My opportunity to serve God is gone. The rest of my life, however long or short, will be wasted. That's absolutely untrue. It's untrue because the Lord Jesus Christ still loves us and still uses us for his glory. So he has work for us, and that's really, really wonderful. He'll bring you through. He'll give you grace and mercy, and he'll bring you through the deepest and darkest trials, the worst things that stand before you that bring you to fear. Yep. I'm not speaking for anybody else. I'm speaking for myself. There were those times when fear washed over me uh, and I felt paralyzed by it. But the Lord had mercy on me. Kevin says, mighty intercessor, don't turn away from him. Don't turn away from Jesus. There's no need to. The Lord loves us. We can tell him our um, greatest trials and deepest difficulties. Anger. Anger. Anger is a very real temptation for getting divorced. Somebody's angry with us and we are very tempted to be angry with them. I can certainly say I was tempted to be not only angry, but very angry about the divorce, very angry about the way things um, that went. We can be angry about our loss. We can be angry about the way we've been ill-treated or misrepresented. We can be um, angry about. Uh, we can be angry at the dif that the um, divorce lawyer that the other side is using. Um, they are clearly being paid by somebody else to do us harm, and it's very easy to do that to feel angry towards the divorce lawyer. What's the point? And we can be angry at God. Now, I would never recommend being angry with God, but many people say, "Well, I'm angry with God." And I don't think it's a good idea, but some Christians are, and they feel angry with God. If you are angry with God, I think it's extremely important that you recognize that and take that to God. He's big enough to take that. God is able to shoulder that burden. So if I'm angry with God, I must say, Lord, because of all the things that are happening to me, I'm angry with you. Why did you allow this? Why did you allow this to happen to me? And as with Job, God is well able to answer your questions if people have difficult questions, or if I have difficult questions, I take them to God and leave them with him. But if anger is unchecked, and if we don't work on this, and if we don't look for a supernatural, Holy Spirit, gracious uh, or, or, um, response to our anger, that anger will take over. That anger will, um, will become the defining uh, experience of our divorce. It will quench the Holy Spirit. It will, uh, it will stop us from being Christian witnesses, and it will make everybody else miserable and us miserable as well. Um, sometimes we, we, um, we are angry because of a sense of our own impotence or a sense of our own, or, uh, sorry, a sense of our own importance. We, we can be filled with a sense of our own importance. Remember the classic thing of somebody saying, well, do you know who I am? And the police officer saying, I don't care who you are, you're getting a ticket anyway. Um, sometimes we are angry because of a sense of our own importance. And sometimes we are angry because of a sense of our own worthlessness. And we can have the same thing at the same time. Um, and uh, anger, any of us have been through this, it doesn't even matter if, if, if this isn't your experience in life. We, we, are, we are prone to anger. We are fallen creatures. Anger without a cause, excessive anger, anger that continues. It can be a short outburst of wrath or it can be a deep-seated, blistering, terrible, burning, simmering anger that goes on permanently in our lives. And that's that's going to destroy everything. It will harm our witness. It will harm us. It will harm uh, the church, it will harm our children, it will harm everybody. Um, but we may feel it's justified. So we need to take our anger to the Lord. Um, and uh, we need to put to death that anger. Ephesians 4 verse 31, if we turn to Ephesians 4 verse 31, we read, 
because anger is anger is an ugly thing. Anger is something that we cannot glorify God in. And even if people have sinned against us and they've inflicted terrible harm on us, we must we must manage our anger in a godly and a spiritual way, in a Christian way. Ephesians four verse thirty one reads, um, "Let all bitterness and wrath." and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. No, that means putting away the malice, not putting it away with malice, putting away the malice. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away. All, not just some, yes, I've been wronged. Yes, that person has been cruel to me in my eyes. Yes, there's been bitter things that have taken place. Yes, I could um, I could nurse my wounds. I could massage my anger. And Satan will be saying to me the whole time, be a little bit more angry. Come on, you're right. You, you've been treated badly. You, you've got a just cause to be anger, uh, angry. Remember, um, thank you, Proverbs 29, and thank you for quoting Rosaria Butterfield, who's got this wonderful, wonderful testimony, and you can find that on the IFTCC uh, or, uh, or the Core Issues Trust um, YouTube pages. Um, Rosaria Butterfield, quite a witness in our day, she is, and thank you for raising that. The safest posture to strike is on bended knee. Absolutely. So if, like me, you're prone to be angry and you feel angry and you think you're justified in your anger, then take that to the Lord in prayer. And we can only overcome anger with God's strength. Satan will be stoking that fire, won't he, saying, oh, you're justified. There are others who are angry with us. It's much easier for us to see other people's failings towards us than our failings towards them. We might not necessarily be just angry with the person that's divorcing us, but with others. Um, we might be angry with the church or other Christians or somebody else, but we must take that to the Lord. The idea, the, the aim is zero anger. The aim is zero anger. We need God's strength. We need grace abundant, which God promises us. We need the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. So if you are going through a process which is making you angry and you have what you believe are just causes for anger, and take it to God in prayer and say, my, my, my Lord, give me the position of zero anger. And if, if years later this anger springs up again in me, then let me, let me um, extinguish it straight away. Let me bring it, let me recognize it. Let me bring my anger to you and say, Lord, take away my anger. There's no place for anger in my life, in my heart, especially if I'm prone to anger as well. I pray for a peaceful heart and I pray that you take away my anger. Um, for some of us, anger was one of the things that contributed to our divorces and we should be repentant for that and we should be ashamed of that but uh, again i'm not pointing the finger at anybody other than myself but we must avoid anger because anger will lead to bitterness and malice if we don't if we don't extinguish it we need grace we need god's grace now isaiah chapter 12 and verse 1 tells us concerning god's way of dealing with his own anger towards us. Now, God's anger is holy and pure and just. If God is angry with us, then we deserve it. But here in Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 1, we read, And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. How is that extraordinary, isn't it, that God's anger is turned away from me in Jesus Christ and through the gospel? Well, in Psalm 23 and verse 2, before I quote that, I just wanted to say this. Also, God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, the, says the Lord. So we walk away. It, it, somebody's taken our house from us. Somebody's taken something from us which is very precious to us, and we can't get it back. Leave it with the Lord. Leave it with the Lord. He will give you treasure and riches from his own hand, from his own storehouse. But walk away and say, the Lord will repay. I also want to say something else about this, and that is the greatest grief for me in my divorce, and again, I'm speaking for myself, the greatest grief for me in my divorce was this, and that is that I, my ex-wife, fell away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And to be perfectly frank and honest with you, compared to all the other things that were going on, that was the worst. Because with all my heart, I desire that she would find and know the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing that's happened, nothing that's gone on would make me not want to see her a saved person, saved by the grace of God. And uh, I can direct my prayers now to praying for her, really praying for her, that she would understand and find and see that for herself in a way that she never did before. So 
rather than seeking vengeance and rather being angry, I'm grieved and mourning over her loss, far more than any loss that I've suffered, because I haven't lost the Lord Jesus Christ. I still have him as my saviour, and if I have the Lord Jesus and lose everything else in this world, then I have treasure in heaven. So Psalm 23, if we're angry, Psalm 23 verse 2 says to us, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Lord, when I'm angry, make me to lie down in green pastures. Lord, when I'm angry, it's boiling up in me, and I'm wondering how I control it. Lead me beside the still waters. Speak peace to my heart. Cause me to rest in you, Lord Jesus. Take away by your Holy Spirit my anger. Cleanse me in your blood. Wash me and enable me to be a Christian who is able to forgive and overcome all of these things. Bitterness. This follows on from um, anger, doesn't it? I'm bitter about the things that have happened to me. I'm bitter that I lost my house, my family home, the one that I worked for for so many years. I'm bitter that I've lost so much money. Um, I'm bitter that I can't see the children. I'm bitter that I've lost my friends. I've lost my respect. I've lost my health. I'm bitter that I've lost my reputation or lost my job. The list is endless. And the tendency to bitterness is very, very strong in us. But like anger, there's no place for bitterness in our lives if we're Christians. We must recognize and expunge this poisonous wheat as soon as it arises. Whatever we've lost, we've gained far more in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what it tells us. It says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And, and so on here. Um, we have here the... Um, the promise that we have something so much more, so much greater. Um, and if we find that we're prone to bitterness or tempted to bitterness, and I certainly have had to wrestle with this myself in my own situation, then we must take that to God in prayer as well. There must be no place for bitterness in our heart, no matter what somebody has done to us. There must be no bitterness towards others. That's an extraordinarily powerful witness, isn't it? Jesus said, love your enemies. And the world can't do that, and we couldn't do that before the Lord Jesus came along and saved us by his grace. Love your enemies. There must be no bitterness in us for any reason whatsoever. Now, I know that my divorce has ended with my ex-wife and I being able to be friends, and I'm very glad about that, very glad about that. But there are some divorces where the people set out to do as much harm to the other person as possible, and I know Christians who are still years later being pursued by their exes their exes just simply want to destroy them, kill them even. They take them to court again and again and again, and they wear them out, and it costs them more than they can afford, and, and I'm aware of that. And it takes grace, and it takes mercy, and it takes the goodness promised to us here in Psalm 23 to enable us to avoid bitterness in such situations. All of us are prone to bitterness, I think. I know I am. And I think also that Satan, again, is stoking that fire and he's saying, go on, just be a little bit bitter. You were wronged. You deserved better. That person harmed you. Look at the rotten person they are. Just be a little bit bitter. Nurse your grievance. Bring it out and play with it and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and nurse it and, 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 and uh, look at your bitterness and see, see what it's based on and let it grow. And that's what Satan says to us. And uh, we, uh, we aren't to do that. We're to take our bitternesses to the Lord. Verses, Hebrews 12, 15. Um, Hebrews 12, 12 15. Um, about bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15. Oh, I keep turning over beyond the book of Hebrews. There we are, Hebrews 12, 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So roots of bitterness can spring up in us like poisonous weeds. In this country, there's a thing called Japanese knotweed. I presume it comes from Japan. 
it's an invasive species and if it's near your home it will knock huge amounts of money off the value of your home because it can grow through concrete and bring um, houses into uh, disre disrepair. So the question is this, this weed of, um, of uh, bitterness can easily spring up in our hearts. We have to guard against it. We don't want a root of bitterness. That will spoil our witness. It will spoil our lives. It will ruin our lives. If you're a bitter person, that bitterness will define you. It will control you, and that will be your life. Bitterness will be your life. If your bitterness is not there, it's taken away, then that's so glorifying and honoring to the Lord. As Christians, we show by our lack of anger and our lack of bitterness that we are true servants and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We would have cried, crucify him, and yet he is not bitter towards us at all. He laid down his life for us. He gave himself for us. He counted us worthy of that love, even though we are unworthy. If we have a root of bitterness in us, let's take it to the Lord in prayer and say there must be no bitterness. If I can't deal with this bitterness, if I can't bring it to the Lord Jesus, then, then um, I can't serve him. And that bitterness will define my life and it will destroy me. Bitterness destroys us. Now, there, I think there are two kinds of bitterness. There's a sort of bitterness outside. The Lord Jesus had to drink a bitter cup, and there's a bitterness inside, and it's a bitterness that's on the inside, how we react to things that I'm speaking of. And those things may be very bad. They may be very terrible, but God has promised us better in this psalm. But if we are bitter, let's go to Psalm 23 in verses 3 and verse 5. Verse 3, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Are you bitter about something in your life? It may not be divorce. It may be something else. It may be your employers and the way they've treated you. It may be because you've had a certain illness and you uh, have been uh, waylaid. Or it may be because of something else in your life. He restoreth my soul. Isn't that so much greater than any bitterness? Isn't that greater than our circumstances? He restoreth my soul. Restoring my soul means removing of anger and bitterness. He, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is my shepherd, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Isn't it wonderful to be led in the paths of righteousness? It's just so much, so much above all of the things that are going on in this world, our circumstances. Last night, I had an extraordinary dream. And I'm not going to tell you this dream was from God, and I'm not going to tell you this is uh, it has a supernatural meaning. That's not what I'm here to do. But that dream was that I was, in fact, John Bradford, who was a reformer who was burnt at the stake. And I dreamt I was John Bradford the night before he was due to be martyred. And in my dream, I was absolutely convinced. It was only when I woke up that I realized I wasn't John Bradford. I was David Macrath. And in my dream, I was wrestling and saying, how can I face this? How can I go to that? How can I go there? And uh, in the dream, I was crying out to God for grace to bear it graciously, this terrible thing which did happen to John Bradford and um, that was just a dream but the thing about it is this how could I compare my trials to the trials of a man who in that situation was going to be martyred if you were John Bradford's wife would you be bitter towards the people who burned him I hope not I hope you would find grace and love in your heart forgive them but the thing about it is this, I consider my trials to be very light, and they're very light compared to the glory that's to be revealed within us. There's no time and there's no room for bitterness in this world. The Lord Jesus will restore our souls, and he will lead us in the paths of righteousness. The sweetest, most blessed thing to me in the last umpteen years is this, and right now and today and here, is that I can serve and I can walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. I can follow him. That matters to me more than anything else. If I can lift up the name of Jesus. Yesterday I preached in the open air in Kidderminster here, and it was a real blessing. What you don't get from the recording, which some of you, thankfully, I mean, thankfully, thank you for those of you who listen to the recording. Um, the thing about that recording is that it doesn't lead on to what happened next, and that is several people came up and asked me questions, and they were asking me questions for a whole hour uh, about the gospel, and that was amazing, and I'm really thankful to the Lord for that. Verse 5, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Now, where does the Lord Jesus Christ give us a table? 
He gives us a table in the presence of his enemies. Those who hate us, those who have spitefully used us. Do good to those who spitefully use you, the Lord Jesus said. But bless those who persecute you. Do good to those who spitefully use you. But the Lord has given us a table in the presence of our enemies. My own testimony is this. I said yesterday that some people get dropped in deserts. Not yesterday, um, on, on Monday, in fact. Um, that uh, some people get dropped in deserts and some people get dropped in jungles. But I got dropped in the kitchen and I had to forage to survive there. And uh, I've had to learn how to look after myself, having been well looked after for so many years. Um, but uh, the thing about it is this, that the Lord prepares a table for us and he prepares that table in the presence of our enemies. The Lord does that. The ones we might be angry with, the ones we might feel bitter towards. Thou hast prepared a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. And he anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over. That's my testimony. In all of these things, Jesus has been far greater than the puny trials that I've had to face. Others have faced much greater trials. I'm, I, I'm speaking about my own experience in the hope that it would be helpful to others. I'm, I'm very much getting over that and uh, very much striving and seeking to serve the Lord Jesus now uh, in whatever way I can. But but so I'm not, uh, others have had much worse experience and than me others have been f far more broken than me and have had to grapple with far greater um, difficulties and problems and some even years later are facing the savage viciousness of somebody who hates them and wants to destroy them miriam says the lord will preserve thee from all evil he will preserve thy soul psalm 121 verse 7 thank you uh, miriam i'll read that again the lord will preserve thee from all evil he will preserve thy soul these things are real. These are the things that deal with our bitterness. They deal with our um, our trials and difficulties of all kinds. Well, we've said something about fear. We've said something about anger. And we've said something about bitterness. Now we just need to talk about forgiveness. The Lord, in the, his, Lord, in the Lord's Prayer, we're told, Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. It's very easy to pray, but in our lives, we don't naturally forgive people. We are very happy to be forgiven ourselves, but forgiving others is hard for us. But once again, we must come to the Lord for grace. The Lord Jesus, doesn't he? He commands us to forgive. He says we have to forgive the person who harmed me, the person who hates me, the person who's still trying to harm me. Then I must forgive them. And if I forgive them, then I'm becoming like my Savior. I'm becoming like the Lord Jesus. I find it difficult. I find it hard. I think to myself, do you know what they did to me? But you see, I can't, I cannot not forgive them if I follow the Lord Jesus Christ. If I try in my own strength and I try really hard, I'm going to fail. But if I come to the Lord and say, Lord, as you forgave me for my sins, my iniquities, as you wash them away, um, I pray that you'd help me to forgive others. We have to struggle with anger. We have to struggle with bitterness. We have to struggle with fear. We have to struggle with forgiveness. But when you find a Christian who is not afraid in the day of trial and a christian who isn't angry with those who've harmed them and isn't bitter towards those who've taken away what belongs to them uh, and it forgives their enemies and forgives everyone unconditionally as the lord jesus christ um has forgiven them then you find somebody who has great peace in their heart and is walking with the lord jesus christ a lack of forgiveness will quench the holy spirit in our lives i'm not going to forgive lord because there are some things which are too great. Now, there are some things that people have done which I find very hard to forgive because I'm me, because I'm a sinner. But there's no excuse for not forgiving them. If there's difficulty in forgiving, I have to take that to the Lord Jesus Christ. A lack of forgiveness will fire up our anger. A lack of forgiveness will deepen our bitterness and drown us in bitterness. And if the Holy Spirit is quenched, then we'll be handed over to fear, the overwhelming fear. So all of these things go together. But how can I forgive? Only by the grace of God. All of these things put together with forgiveness make us free. Uh, and um, we can cast our burdens on the Lord. Psalm 23 is, is full of this, isn't it? The Lord, The Lord will prepare a table for us in the presence of his enemies. But then in verse 6, 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the promise to you and me, my friends. Doesn't that make our difficulties in this world seem small? Even great difficulties seem small, that goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How can I, who am a sinner, how can I dwell in the house of the Lord forever? Indeed, how can the Lord Jesus be my shepherd? That we began in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Promises to provide all our needs, spiritual and physical and otherwise. And other, and other sorry, not otherwise, other. The Lord is my shepherd because he went to the cross and died there. He bore the penalty for my sins. The Lord Jesus, rather than judging me for my sins, the Lord Jesus, rather than uh, judging me in anger and wrath for my sins, because my sins against him are far greater than any person's sins towards me, my sins against God, my sins of unbelief towards the Lord Jesus Christ before I became a Christian. How is the Lord my shepherd? Because God has sent and given his son, because the Lord Jesus loved me and gave himself for me and died for me, because my sins are forgiven. And if the Lord Jesus died for me, then his loss was infinite compared to any loss that I've had in this world. There was a time when I counted those things to be important and their loss was troublesome to me. But now I know I've gained the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I know that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because he died for me and because I believed on him and I love him. The Lord Jesus died to save me and he has saved me. The Lord Jesus died to give me everlasting life and I have everlasting life. Just want to have a quick look at uh, Luke chap Matthew sorry chapter 5 verses 10 to 12 again very familiar but certainly in context here. Matthew chapter 5 verses 10 to 12 again if we are if we are in trouble, if we're finding it difficult because people have harmed us, again, it may not be divorce, it may be something else, but if we're in trouble, Matthew 5, verses 10 to 12, Bless, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, not be bitter, be angry, be fearful. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And that's a challenge to us as Christians. It's a command. It's a promise. The promise of the grace and the strength and the anointing to do these things. But we find it troublesome. But if we won't, we'll end up in the greatest of trouble and difficulty. As I say, I know people who've gone through this experience of divorce and their former um, spouses have uh, continued to fight them bitterly, even though uh, they are looking for peace. In so much as it depends upon us, we should look for peace. You can't repair those broken things, but you can avoid an ongoing war. And uh, as I say, the greatest grief and the greatest thing that hurt me more than anything else here was the falling away of my um then wife, now my ex-wife, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Compared to, compared to the salvation of a soul, these other worldly things are nothing. That's the greatest grief to me. So forgiveness brings great peace and deliverance from anger and wrath and all of these things. Um, it is a, a mark of grace in our lives, forgiveness. We can't do this in the flesh. It impresses others enormously when they see that we are like this, that we're not trying to get back. We're not trying to justify ourselves or prove that we were right, right and the other party was wrong, that we're not seeking revenge. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. That we are loving those who sadly were once our friends have now become our enemies. And uh, we are doing good to those who spitefully use us. So the Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd because he has forgiven me, because he laid down his life, because he paid a higher price for the unworthy and for his rebels and for those who hated him than anything that we could lose in this world, far higher. What can I say? Well, I want to close this in saying that after five and a half years after my then wife took the dog for a walk and didn't return, um, I can say this 
surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And looking back over those five years and looking back over the last three years in, in Hull and places like that, I can say this. I'm quite convinced that goodness and mercy have attended my ways. Trials and sufferings, plenty. Troubles and difficulties, plenty. Failings and um, backsliding, some uh, and plenty. Uh, and um, yet goodness and mercy have followed me as my testimony that I found the Lord Jesus to be greater than all of these things, better than all of these things, above all of these things. And he has loved me with his love. He gave himself for me. He has kept me by his grace. He has fulfilled his word. He has given me a, a table in the presence of mine enemies. He has made me to lie down in green pastures. He has led me beside the still waters. The Lord Jesus has restored my soul. And he has led me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Father, help us in life's great trials and difficulties, and especially when we are, if we are being hated by somebody whom we love, and if we're going through a process over which we have no control, and if we are losing those most precious things to us in this world, Father, we pray that you would have mercy upon us. Lead us behind, beside the still waters. Restore our souls. Make our testimony as we look back on these days that surely goodness and mercy have followed us all the days of our lives. But Father, thank you that we have so much of a greater promise of that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus has paid the price for our sins. His blood was shed for the remission of our sins he gave himself, you gave him to us, Father. You didn't spare him, but you sent him to the cross of Calvary, and there he laid down his life. Oh, how small our trials are, how small our grumbles and our bitternesses and our grievances are compared to what the Lord Jesus Christ gave up for us. And Father, we pray that in this world, before all other considerations, we might be found to be those who love the Lord Jesus who desire to walk with him, who love him and desire to follow him and who know him and who know the power of your word and the power of these promises in our hearts. And Father, I pray that you'd help those who are wrestling and struggling, those who are on the receiving end of cruel treatment this evening, Lord, those who are being abused, those who aren't being believed, those who have the root of bitterness, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you set us free from that and have mercy upon us. And, oh, Lord, that our eyes might be fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those of us who have been through this experience, Lord, well, I can only pray for myself, but I pray that we all might pray for those who may have treated us cruelly, for those who, to whom we are no longer married, that you'd have mercy upon them, Lord, that just as you restore our souls, that you'd restore their souls as well, Lord, and have mercy upon them as well. For we do not desire, Lord, that they would perish in their unbelief. Have mercy upon them. And Lord, if for our sins we ask forgiveness and cleansing in Jesus' blood also. And so we commend ourselves to you this evening in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, I set out to do three talks on the subject of marriage and divorce and remarriage, and uh, there's a couple more to go. So we've done four so far. So, and that's how it works out. And really, I could have done with doing four separate uh, sessions on what we've been talking about this evening. But I feel I feel under pressure of time, especially because of what's going on with um, Islam and everything in the United in the United Kingdom here, and in probably a, a country near you right now. Um, that uh, that. There's a lot going on. The, the nations are being shaken. Our nation is being shaken. The question is, will the people turn back to God or will they give in and um, uh, pass on and perish? And by turn back to God, of course, I mean, will they repent of their sins, seek God with all their hearts, embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, find the salvation that, that comes from God? So uh, that's what's going on right now. We are living in a very dynamic and very changing situation. The Lord's judgments are abroad in all the earth. And I know in Australia it's um, it's not so dissimilar. And I know that in the United States it's not so dissimilar um, that our nations are being uh, torn apart by um, divisions which seem to be pre-planned, which are certainly from Satan anyway, no question about that. So let's walk circumspectly. Let's walk with the Lord Jesus Christ I should go back to the material. Are, are there any questions? Does anybody want to 
um, add anything or, 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 or make, ask any questions or, or criticize anything that uh, I've said, um, please feel free to make your comments. And uh, um, it, it, the experiences I went through were bitter, but I'm through those now, I think, and uh, by God's grace. But there's, there, there, there's just no room. There's no room for bitterness. If I was, if I, I, I've had to wrestle with this, and I'm sure I'll have to wrestle with it again. But if I allow bitterness to spring up, that bitterness will ruin my testimony because it's a negation of what Jesus has done for me. The Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd goes before me. I hear his voice and I, I follow him. That's my life. We read Romans chapter 14 and verse 8, didn't we? Um, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And uh, I trust that's true of every one of us. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and our lives and times are in his hands. There was a time four or five years ago when I thought there was nothing left for me, nothing that lay ahead, nothing good, nothing that could possibly happen. My testimony was ruined. Everything was ruined. And that's proven to be false and wrong and untrue. God's word, however, has shone and proven itself. The Lord Jesus has proven himself to be my shepherd. And uh, I thank the Lord for that. Uh, well, Kim, that's one of the positive things that, that came out of it. And uh, uh, I couldn't have had this ministry, but for that, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not going to say uh, that I, I'm, I'm glad I was divorced, but I can say that I'm very, very glad that, uh, that I'm able to, to, to speak and teach the word of God in the way that I can. And I pray that God would help me to do that. Um, thank you for your comments, Kim, and you're always an encouragement. Thank you, Kim. Um, please, please pray for this this work. Please pray that it would continue to grow. It's growing very slowly, um, and uh, I, my prayer is that it would spread. Um, there are the podcasts that are being set up, and uh, there's the second YouTube channel as well. I put up a wonderful sermon by uh, by um, Andrew Bonar. This book, this wonderful, wonderful book, Sheaves After Harvest by uh, Andrew Bonar. Uh, it's a wonderful sermon on the subject of praise, and it's on the other channel. And because people go there because they want to hear Spurgeon's devotionals, and Spurgeon's devotionals are amazing. But that one by Andrew Bonar um, is worth listening to. And uh, I, I've done the whole series from that book before, but I'm going to do it again, and uh, hopefully with improved acoustics and things. Uh, acoustics, is that the word? Um, audio, improved audio, um, and uh, by God's grace. But... Uh, Lots, lots going on. Uh, there's the open air, and as I said, yesterday's open air was extremely encouraging, and uh, I thank the Lord for that. Um, and uh, my my prayer is just that God will bring people to me. Well, Miriam, thank you for opening your heart to us. It is um, it, it is good, but I'm just so, I'm so aware that that. You know, I, I, I've had a measure of closure in my situation, which is acceptable to me. A lot of people never get closure. Closure is really important, but they never get it. Or they end up in a situation which is terrifying, where the, the other person is always out to get them, and that's terrifying. I'm glad that's not my case. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't deny that damage, a lot of damage was done, but what I can do is I can avoid bitterness and fear and anger and unforgiveness. And uh, and all of those things I find in abundance in my own heart. All of those things I find in abundance in my heart. I must put to death the old man. I must bring them to God and by His grace. But uh, it's a uh, it's a challenge for each one of us in our own situations, and that's my challenge as well. But I find the Lord to be true to His word. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Um, yeah, it's amazing when you fall out of a loft. And again, I'm not saying we've all done it. I'm not saying we should do it. It's amazing that halfway down, you get these thoughts in your head um, and you remember them very clearly. You know, what did I do that for? Oh dear, I can't stop what's going to happen next. <laughs> um, thank you, Gavin. Uh, Kim said something lovely there. She has. Bless you, Kim. And thank you, Gavin, for your comments as well. And um, so... Um, well, I've done all the talking. Perhaps somebody else would like to talk. <laughs> uh, no, please carry on if you've got comments. Please, otherwise, otherwise we'll uh, we'll call it a day. But uh, I, I, I'd say this: that that when I when I when I when I had to leave my home, that was a very bitter blow um, to me. 
um, because that was to me that represented 30 years of hard work and apart from other things and it was nice and I liked it and uh, um, but the thing about that is then I ended up in Hull and before I ended up in Hull I was feeling these waves of fear coming over me that I was going to everything was I was just never going to get work I was never going to find a place to live and so on and that wasn't true I was in God's hands and when I went to Hull I can honestly say about Hull that those three years in Hull, in, in Brother Tim's house, when he was in Texas for those three years, I borrowed his house, that those were actually three of the happiest years of my life. And they were happy because with all of the challenges and trials, the Lord Jesus was there. He was in that. And you know a lot of the work in Hull. You know a lot of the evangelism that was done. And I hope I can go back there and preach the gospel in Hull again soon. Um, but when the Lord is in a situation, it changes everything. The Lord is with us. Um, now, I think Ian is talking about my house, plastic $2 trinkets. It's a hard lesson, Ian, but it's one that's worth learning because that house can be an idol, can it? can't it? It can make me very comfortable and very pleased and very proud and very happy and very indolent when it comes to spiritual things. Take it away and I'm cast on the Lord. And I have to learn that in this world, we have no continuing city we're looking for a heavenly city and we're looking for the world to come. Um, Psalm 23, verse 6, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But the great thing is this, that it wasn't the end of my life. It wasn't the end of my usefulness. It wasn't the end of me serving God. It wasn't the end of me growing in grace. It was it was a step on the way. And I, ha you know, I, ha I have to say this, that, uh, that it was the Lord's will that that divorce would go through, much as I hated it at the time and, and, I, and I still hate it um I can't undo it I can't turn the clock back but um distressing as it was the Lord allowed it it was his will that I went through that and others went through that as well and um that I accept that I accept um I wish I wish I wish my ex-wife I wish she knew the Lord Jesus I really wish she knew the Lord Jesus and some of us in the same situation that's that's the thing that matters most to me um out of this whole situation um but i don't know maybe one day the lord will will open her eyes and change her heart and bring her back that would be wonderful but that's in god's hands i must move forward and serve the lord jesus christ as we all must as every one of us here must um Amanda, we're always very good. It's always good to see you, uh, and um, uh, we're always thrilled. Um, and uh, when you, when you, when you when you arrive, and um, uh, as I said, you you have a particular ministry of encouragement, and we value that ministry very highly, indeed. Um, and the Lord bless you, Amanda. Um, and uh, we've all overslept. We haven't all fallen out of loss, but we've all overslept at some time, haven't we? Um, yes. Well, I'm going to, um, unless there are uh, questions or, as I say, if people want to contact me, uh, if you go to sermonaudio.com and type, I know it's a bit complicated, I keep meaning to put my email on the uh, the YouTube channel, but um, if you go to Sermon Audio to the page with my name, you'll find a, an email contact button at the top left hand of the page, because uh, there's a page with my name in, and on the, at sermonaudio.com. You just have to spell Macarith correctly, <laughs> but there we are. Um, so I'm going to turn the camera off now. People, I'll leave it running for a minute. People, if they want to, can say uh, um, give their greetings to each other and make further comments if you wish. Um, and uh, my microphone is still working, so I can actually respond if, if I need to. But uh, generally, people are just saying their greetings. And the Lord bless and be with each one of you and encourage you at this time. Amen.